talking about the um, origin of the contrast between good and bad, which initially was not part of the moral system of evaluation. It was part of what we call the noble system of evaluation. So call, contrasting something as either good or bad, obviously, on its face, is evaluating the thing. The good things are better than the bad things. Obviously, but it's not a system of moral evaluation, which wants to say. Instead, these terms are initially associated simply with social class. And those on top, the rulers, are good, higher classes. The ones who are ordinary or lower are bad. And then, again, without any moral judgment or assessment of them. Uh, and then, secondarily, the traits or properties or characteristics associated with, with each of those classes um, comes to be called, those properties or traits come to be called good or bad also in the secondary way. Okay, but um, the traits associated Sorry, but now Nietzsche distinguishes between what he calls the knightly aristocratic class and the priestly class, um, religious uh, authorities. Uh, and the traits that are associated um, with, the, um, with each of these two classes are very different. Um, and in fact are opposed to one So he says, uh, section 7 here, um, the knightly aristocratic value judgments have as their presupposition a powerful physicality, a blossoming, rich, even overflowing health, together with that which is required for its preservation of this physicality and strength. Uh, namely, war, adventure, the hunt, dance, athletic contests, and in general, everything which includes strong, free, cheerful-hearted activity. The priests, on the other hand, are the one, the priestly class, are, on the other hand, are the one <coughs> who lack this. They precisely do not have or have renounced this powerful physicality. And so they, as I mentioned last time, uh, associate themselves with purity. Um, and uh, eventually this comes to mean something like purity of soul. But initially, it's physical purity. It's renouncing worldly affairs, dirt, and blood, and sex, and any kind of indulgence of one's passions. Um, so they keep themselves pure of these things, um, and these are obviously in opposition to these different um, uh, forms of evaluation. Now, for Nietzsche, the priestly class value these kinds of uh, self-denial, this, this kind of purity, um, precisely because they are the ones who are less capable of carrying out their wills. Either they are weaker or have renounced the powerful physicality of the knightly aristocratic class. Um, and so um, he thinks they become haters. They become hateful toward those who um, are powerful um, or are more powerful than they. So just about the middle of page 16. He says, um, out of their powerlessness, their hate grows into something enormous and uncanny, into something most spiritual and most poisonous. There are two sides to this. This is what is going to give us human beings, our depth, our psychological difference from mere animals, 
This is what makes us spiritual and higher. But it also is poisonous. Eventually, this is going to lead to fierce denials. The truly great haters in the history of the world have always been priests. Also, the most ingenious haters. Compared with the spirit of priestly revenge, all the rest of spirit taken together hardly merits consideration. Um, okay, so it's this hatred toward the strong, hateful, hatred toward the powerful, hatred toward our physical embodiments that uh, is what I said again. Um, makes us something other than merely stupid animals. But on the other hand, it's how we became spiritual. But on the other hand, um, it also is very dangerous. Um, so for Nietzsche, the Jews, in particular the ancient Jews, are his example of um, this priestly form of, of valuation. And it's with them that we get what he calls, um, at the end of section seven, um, the slave revolt in morality. So this is going to be the source of the creation of moral values, the source of the creation of the moral system of evaluation. Um, and as we'll see, this moral system of evaluation involves an inversion of the um, noble system of values. Uh, and he thinks that, I just said that ancient Jews are sort of his exemplar of this. Um, he thinks of Christianity as, in my words, not his, a kind of Jewish cult, a kind of initially minor offshoot of this system of valuations. Um, and it's more or less a continuation of the moral system of values. Um, so um, at the very end of that section, he says, um, namely, that with the Jews, the slave revolt in morality begins. That revolution which has a 2,000 year history behind it and which has only moved out of our sight today because it has been victorious. Um, okay, so the, what he calls the slave revolt in morality is the process by which moral values have overtaken and surpassed noble values. Uh, and although he talks about it as a slave revolt, it's not an instantaneous thing. It literally has taken 2,000 years. So it's a constant battle uh, with one side uh, picking up gains in some uh, eras and, and the other fighting back. Um, but he thinks that um, in modern European societies, there's no doubt which one has um, been, become dominant morality. But I want to remind you that um, I point to the passage in Beyond Good and Evil when he's talking about these two systems of value. And he says that every society is a mix of different and competing value systems. Um, so the slave revolt uh, was not a single instantaneous event in which the values of society flipped or um, inverted. And it's not something that has been completely triumphant. Um, although he thinks moral values are dominant in our society, for sure we can still see traces of um, competing value systems. Section 8. But you don't understand that? You don't have eyes for something that's taken 2,000 years to achieve victory? There's nothing to wonder in this. All lengthy things are difficult to see, to see in their entirety. Um, and then he tells the rest of this section here, he tells the story of um, how the moral values, the 
one, one over the noble ideals. And this was um, maybe a strategy that the proponents of the moral values, namely the Jews, had to become triumphant. Um, and what they had to do, they, they came up with this ingenious idea, namely um, to sacrifice one of their own. Um, and so, of course, they had to change their name in um, this transition. They are no longer Jews, they're Christians. Um, and of course, some didn't go for this uh, change, didn't go in for this name change. Um, but the values that the ancient Jews accepted, the moral values, now under the heading of Christian values, um, were ultimately successful. And triumphed, he says, over what he calls further down, uh, over onto 18, um, over more noble ideals. So no real difference here between the value, the moral values that ancient Jews and Christians um, firm, uh, um, both in opposition to noble values. So it's these kinds of passages, I think, that sometimes lead people to think that Nietzsche is being anti-Semitic. Um, but a couple things to note. First of all, usually anti-Semitism is directed at Jews from the standpoint of maybe a certain kind of Christianity. And of course, that's not Nietzsche's point at all. He thinks that both embrace more or less the same system of values. Um, and in the next um, section, on um, page 18, he has um, somebody who's a free spirit saying, to, saying uh, everything is Jewifying or Christifying or mobifying as we watch. What do the words matter? Same thing. So, Jewifying, Christifying, mobifying, all of this is cutting things down to the lowest common denominator, to the weakest of the individuals, to those who are unable to really accomplish very much and um, celebrate that weakness. On the other hand, let's remind you, again, that these priestly values of self-denial priestly values of um, asceticism give us our psychological depth and make us interesting. This is what elevates us from mere animals. Okay, section nine. Um, so this, section nine starts in quotes. So Nietzsche is imagining somebody saying to him in reply to this, but why are you still talking about nobler ideals? Let's submit to the facts. Just look around. Somebody saying, the people, that is the mob, ordinary, weak individuals, the people were victorious, or the slaves, or the mob, or the herd, or whatever you like to call them. If this happened through the Jews, or Christianity, so be it. Then never has a people had a more world historic mission. So Nietzsche is imagining somebody objecting to him and saying, um, sorry, actually, I'm going to continue at the very, um, the very bottom of 18. There's a closed quote. And then he says, this is the epilogue of a free spirit to my speech, an honest animal, as he is richly betrayed, moreover a Democrat. He has listened to me up until then and couldn't stand to hear me be silent. But at this point, he says, I have much to be silent about. OK, so um, this reply is something like this. Yeah, 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 Nietzsche, you're right that there's been this transition and change in values. Um, but look, which side has won? Which values have been triumphant? The thought is that Nietzsche shouldn't be critical of these